Hi, this is Jen Rubin, and this is Jen Rubin's Green Room. Well, I just got back, and I mean just got back, from the March for Israel on the Ball. It was extraordinary. The diversity of people, uh, the geographic spread of the crowd, the age, uh, the race, the religious uh, affiliation of people was truly remarkable. The place was packed. Um, it's very hard when you're in the middle of the crowd to kind of see how big it is. Um, but I am certain they have cleared the hundred thousand mark and perhaps the 200,000 mark as well. So coming back from that, you know, I was sort of thinking, what did I take away from this? What was my, um, kind of sense of the event? And, In some ways, it was the reminder of, you know, what Nixon used to call the silent majority, that most Americans are not those crazy pro-Hamas demonstrators who are tearing down the posters of kidnapped victims. Most Americans are not chanting from the river to the sea, meaning the extermination of Israel and all the Jews. Most Americans are pro-Israel. Most Americans are horrified by the terrorists. And most Americans are not anti-Semites. And I think this was an extremely healthy thing to remind the majority of America, not only that Jews are here, but that normal people are here. And there were many Christians in the crowd. They had signs, Christians for Israel. Um, there were many people um, who probably have very little Jewish affiliation who were there. But it's a reminder, not only to the Jewish community, I think, but the larger community, that the most radical, the loudest, the nastiest, the meanest voices are not a majority of the population, not even close. And in fact, when you get down to some real number crunching, they're not even a significant part of the Democratic Party. A lot of people have said, oh, Biden will be in trouble with young people. Young people won't turn out to vote. They're mad at him because he's been so pro-Israel. Well, recent poll out about 12,000 people uh, from YouGov shows that young people are much more positive about Biden's treatment and handling of the Middle East than older generations. They like him more, not less. So we get these assumptions built on a very small segment of the population that we shouldn't ignore because they're dangerous and they're in some cases uh, creating violence and spreading hatred. So we shouldn't ignore them, but we shouldn't give them too much attention. We shouldn't think that they are representative of a larger segment of America beyond themselves. So that was one kind of big takeaway I took. Um, And the other was the mood of the people. Unlike those other protests that you've seen at colleges, no one was screaming death to anyone. No one was calling for the extermination of another population. No one was screaming for revenge. No one was screaming for murder, an eye for an eye. Even though these are people in many cases who have relatives who've been kidnapped or killed, have relatives that are serving in the IDF, That was not the spirit of what this was. This was about responding to anti-Semitism here and around the world. This was about standing with Israel. And this was a plea to return the hostages, uh, the the kidnapped uh, people. And I will say, um, it hit me hard on Monday when I read that one of the captives, beautiful young woman, first name is Noah, who originally had thought to have been kidnapped, had actually been killed and not clear to me when it was. And I gasped when I saw that because I had met her mother about a week ago. She had come to the United States um, with a number of the other families. She had come to a vigil that I was attending at the Red Cross where they hold a vigil every Sunday, 1230, by the way, if you're in Washington, D.C., at the Red Cross building. She spoke about her daughter. She showed a picture of her lovely young woman, 19 years old. And it really hit me that that mother who was absolutely torn apart but had some hope that she would see her daughter once again now has nothing, 
She has just sorrow and loss. And you think about 244 families like that who will either have terrible, horrible news that their loved one is gone, or they will eventually see their loved one again, who will be forever scarred by this experience. So I think I got to be honest, the moral stature of the people who were there and of the people who are experiencing real loss is so much higher, is so much purer, is so much more decent than the people who are ripping down the posters, the people who are calling for death to uh, Jews, death to Israel. There is just no comparison. And sometimes you just have to come out and say it. That is not to say that the Palestinians are not victims. And that was what was so extraordinary about the march. Every speaker um, spoke about the Palestinians and the Palestinian children who had been ill-served by Hamas, who were victims as well. The crowd didn't boo. They applauded. They agree. They're not out to harm. They're not out to, as the far left accuses them of being out to destroy Palestinians. They're out to destroy Hamas, the terrorist group, the barbarians who killed 1,200 innocents, kidnapped over 240 people. That's who deserves our ire, not the Palestinian people, not Palestinian children. And so it really was an eye opener in that regard. And it was also a reminder, as we sit here on a Tuesday that we're recording this, uh, the House is struggling to keep the government open, that even if they manage to make this hurdle, clear this hurdle, they're still going to have the problem because Israel aid, Ukraine aid, Taiwan aid is not included in this kind of patchwork um maneuver that is going to potentially keep the government open. So when is that? When does Israel, when does Ukraine, when do the Taiwanese get their protection, get their sign that the West and the United States in particular has not abandoned them? Maybe December, maybe there's some kind of vote. That is just inexcusable. And for Republicans to cry about how much they love Israel, but to ignore it, to leave it and leave aid for Ukraine, who is fighting Russia, the very same people that are supporting Iran and supporting Hamas, is beyond hypocrisy. It's absolutely shameful. They go to these marches, and in fact, um, both the um, minority leader Um, and, uh, the house and the speaker of the house uh, came to the march. Mike Johnson goes up there and he talks about, you know, no ceasefire. We have to stand with Israel. Well, where's the aid? Where's his foreign policy? Why isn't he standing up to the crazies in his own group? I don't know. I guess it's all talk. Wouldn't you know? Pretty remarkable, huh? Not, not all that surprising, to be honest. So I think we've come through a week or so where it's been clarifying, put it that way. I think we've clarified who's on what side in the debate about Israel. I think it's been clarifying about which of the two major parties really cares about protecting democracy around the world and ensuring that our allies are not defeated by barbarous regimes and barbarous terrorist organizations. I think it's been pretty clear that although the New York Times can publish all the polls they want, that the American people actually don't like anything the Republicans have to offer and keep voting Democratic as they did uh, a week ago when they reelected Andy Bashir, when they came very close in Mississippi, actually, um, when they took the both houses in Virginia, and when they passed overwhelmingly a pro-abortion measure in Ohio. So I think we have to give Americans perhaps a little bit more credit and remind ourselves again and again, what you get from the mainstream media and the commentary, what passes for political commentary, what you see reflected on college campuses is not indicative of the country at large. 
And when the country actually votes, when you actually see a mass gathering of perhaps as many as 200,000 people, it's clarifying and it's helpful and it's somewhat reassuring. But I will tell you, if people do not turn out to vote a year from now, if people brush off the 2024 election or they say, oh, I don't really like Biden, he's so old, we're going to be in deep, deep trouble because Donald Trump is no longer hiding who he is. He is going full scale fascist. He is talking about vermin, which is a old Hitlerian phrase meant to dehumanize the opposition. He is talking about mass roundups. He's talking about using the military to end civil uh, demonstrations. Uh, he's talking about stocking the government with a bunch of cronies um, that are going to be loyal to him and him alone. This is scary stuff. It's real. He means it. It's not what Jen Rubin is telling you he'll do. It's what Donald Trump is telling you he will do. So if there were ever a time to uh, steal ourselves for the fight and to stay engaged, now is the time because voting matters as we saw last Tuesday. So uh, having finished off uh, the the news of the day, the news of the week, um, we'll turn to today's guest. Today's guest is Thomas Zimmer. Thomas is a professor at Georgetown, and he is a force of nature on social media, on Substack. He is the author of a book, Democracy Americana. He is one of the most insightful people when it comes to the threat of authoritarianism, the rise of white Christian nationalism, and he is the perfect person to diagnose where we are, where we're going, and what we need to get there. Thomas Zimmer, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Well, you have become a constant presence um, on the thing that used to be called Twitter um, with your extended threads um, and insights into the era in which we live and into the phenomenon of right-wing authoritarianism uh, emerging in the midst of democracies. Um, and um, this is the perfect time to talk to you because, once again, we are faced with the prospect that Donald Trump might return to power. We see a really a Christian authoritarian Speaker of the House um, who's just taken over, and uh, things don't look so good. Um, so let me start with a very basic question. When authoritarians uh, plan to take over in a democracy or they're aiming to take over in a democracy, do they intentionally spawn chaos and confusion? Or is it just coincidental that a period of disunity, gridlock, confusion usually precedes the rise of these kinds of movements? Yeah, I mean... Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting the all the talk about chaos currently in in it, it makes a lot of sense looking at what's just happened in the house for the second time in uh, this year. Yes. Um and I it is it is certainly um it is certainly the case that um sort of it is not good for a democratic system, small d democratic system to have this sort of dis dysfunction and, and chaos, right? But it's also not the case that there's any kind of natural law um that this leads to authoritarianism right so i think what we what we should look at is why is it that um every moment of chaos um on the american right leads to further radicalization that i think is 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 a very interesting question right because again in a vacuum you could you could say well maybe maybe they look at this kind of chaos and they realize they can't go further down that path right and but that's 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 evidently not the case, right? What happens instead is that from the ashes of the chaos rises Mike Johnson, 
and not some moderate figure, right? Um, and I think that it, that to me points to sort of an underlying dynamic, an underlying permission structure on the right that generates this kind of radicalization. Um, because every crisis situation seems to only heighten the sense of being under siege that, that is animating so much of what's happening on the right. I, I would say you, you cannot understand anything that's happening on the right without grappling with this of sense of being under siege. That legitimizes, that amplifies calls to, again, in any kind of crisis situation, hit harder, more aggressively. There's always permission to escalate, but hardly ever to pull back, right? Um, that is not surprising because extremist ideologies, authoritarian movements, they always, they lust for purity. And that usually, they usually hate those in their own midst they perceive to be insufficiently radical or pure as much as they hate the other, right? So yes, there is chaos. Um, and chaos leads us further down the road to authoritarianism. It's not chaos that stands in its own way. And I think that is sort of a temptation that we need to we need to be careful with that. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of people look at what's just happened in the house and basically argue, oh, um, these people, look at them. Look at how incompetent they are. Um, it doesn't matter what their intentions are. They will ultimately be stopped by their own incompetence. And I don't think, I don't think that's the case. I don't think there's much solace to be, to be sort of gained from, from this, right? There's, again, there's no law of nature that says democracy and functional governance cannot be brought down by a bunch of clowns and grifters and sort of chaotic, sort of chaos agents. Um, because I think this is maybe sort of the last thing I want to say on this. It is, it is true that this, this house caucus, this Republican house caucus is very unlikely to sort of <laughs> turn into a, uh, an efficient governing machine or like a legislative right. machine. That's probably not happening, but they, they don't have to be that from the perspective of the larger reactionary political project. Chaos is all that is needed to attempt, uh, to, to halt any attempt, um, uh, at sort of, uh, to, to sabotage any attempt at halting um, the slide into authoritarianism. They don't act in a vacuum. They act as part of a broader reactionary counter-mobilization against democracy. And in this context, it is the Republican-led states, it is the Supreme Court that are putting the reactionary vision into practice. And what we would need, ideally on the federal level from Congress, is legislation to counteract that. We would, for instance, need national legislation guaranteeing voting rights. But that is not coming because, chaotic or not, the GOP in Congress is fully able to block and sabotage that. That, at this point, is all that is needed. Um, and so I, I, I don't see any, um, I don't have any positive takeaways from, from the chaos and the infighting. <laughs> Well, you're in good company. I don't really see um, any upside either. You know, it's interesting that you should say um, it doesn't really matter what their intention is, because however it turns out, it's a win for them. If they bring government to a crashing halt, then they win again because yeah. it gets people upset. People are alienated. People think democracy doesn't work. And if they actually pass or are able to get through one of their extreme pieces of legislation or stop a more progressive piece of legislation, that's a win too. So yeah. they have this ability to kind of, you know, it's like in um, terms with the globs of silver kind of reformulate whenever you punch a hole in them. They seem to coagulate and reform and continue on. It's a remarkable, in some sense, I don't know if it's resilience or adaptability to kind of take what's going on and then use that to fuel even more extremism. Although, you know what, it, it is something of a perverse superpower that Republicans can wield, right? They make functional governance in Washington impossible, and then they turn around and tell the American people, see, we told you, Washington is bad, government doesn't work. But it is an indictment of America's political culture and, and I think media culture that this works, because it shouldn't work. It only works because it is constantly sort of... it. <laughs> It is supported by a mainstream media environment that constantly sort of great reaches for those tropes of government dysfunction and Washington dysfunction because it, it allows them to, um, pretend they're neutral and they're not partisan and they're not taking sides. So they're blaming both sides, right? It's to say that, oh, it's Washington. Washington is dysfunctional. That lets you lament, uh, the state of American politics without saying, well, who's at fault then? Um, and so it, it lets sort of the mainstream media, um, you know, it, it, it keeps up this, this pretense of neutrality and, and sort of, you know, uh, uh, was, look, look how above the fray we are. We're not, we're not partisan. Um, and that is a problem, right? And, and it's also very much helped by this idea. That's an idea that is shared 
across the center and and and, and across of the liberal spectrum of, of American politics that that only only Democrats have agency apparently right yes. um, whatever happens in quote unquote Washington it's got to be the Democrats' fault somehow um, and so I think again um, it, it is a perverse superpower that they can wield but it it shouldn't work and it only works because there's quite a few people who are complicit in making it work. Exactly. And the perfect example of that, of course, was that the media was screaming at Democrats to rescue the Republicans from themselves as they were serially going through these people. Although until now, the rule was always that the party that's in the majority picks their leader and that's it. Um, but somehow the Democrats had to fix this problem and they were at fault because they weren't helping to protect the Republicans from themselves. Um, and that is just the most kind of perverse logic. Um, and yet it seems to mesmerize it. You get words like polarization. Right. Um, you get dysfunction as if it's a floating thing in the atmosphere that just kind of plops down from nowhere, um, as opposed to, as you say, identifying one of these parties is not like the other. One of these parties is playing a different game, is not a small D Democratic Party, but is engaged in a whole nother exercise, um, which is somewhat challenging. You know, one of the frustrations, I think, we all have is, first of all, the mainstream media doesn't do its job. Um, as you know, from reading my work, I rail at this continually. Yeah. Um, but the other is that the right has their own little media universe yeah. that is really airtight, that is absolutely complicit, um, ignores their errors, um, boosts them up, keeps their base in a constant state of yeah. frenzied anger. How, if at all, in a crisis situation? Do you pierce the propaganda machine that the right sets up? Can you do it? And if so, how do you do it? So I think um, I'm going to give you a slightly complicated answer. It might be some of a cop- something of a cop-out answer, but I think it's really important to reflect on how we conceptualize the role and impact of the right-wing propaganda machine. I think there is a per- pervasive idea that it is basically an almighty machine that is brainwashing people, radicalizing them, making them delusional, and that that is the actual core problem that, that we have to address. Um, and look, it is true, the right-wing propaganda machine causes tremendous harm, tremendous harm. It, it keeps the conservative base in constant in a constant state of frenzy and, and panic. It, 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 it elevates every real and imagined challenge to white conservative dominance to the status of an, of an existential threat. But a key reason for the right-wing propaganda's success is that it is deployed in an environment in which people are primed to believe what they are being presented that it channels and crystallizes certain ideological core claims and beliefs. It builds on them, it reinforces them, but it does not create them. We have seen the limits of the right-wing propaganda machine's power when it tried to go against those ideological beliefs. Um, In 2013, this is the example that I, I always try to bring up because it's so interesting. In 2013, Fox News briefly joined the Republican establishment in advocating for immigration reform. Even Sean Hannity was actively defending (laughs) immigration reform. But the pushback from the conservative base was so severe that within weeks, Hannity was back to like riling up his viewers against any kind of immigration compromise. And again, I mean, remember, initially Fox News was also not at all all in on Trump, but the base wanted him and so they pushed him. And so I think, again, the relationship between the right-wing propaganda machine and the base is not adequately captured by the idea of brainwashing. The propaganda channels and amplifies what the base believes and wants. All this, all this, I believe, points to the fact that we have to take these people and their interests seriously. Um, and that means taking their desire for continued white Christian dominance seriously, instead of sanitizing their political choices as a result of just a propaganda machine having brainwashed them, right? This is a real conflict between fundamentally incompatible visions of what this country should be, and there's not going to be a technical fix for this. Um, a, but a reason why so many people are jumping on this whole misinformation, disinformation narrative, um, I'm not saying that's not a problem, but on the misinformation, disinformation as the core problem idea, right? That is attractive to so many people, and I mean, 
liberals, people on the center, precisely because it, suge it suggests there is a technical fix. It proclaims we do not have to grapple with this frightening reality in which our fellow citizens do not want pluralistic democracy. We just have to fix the media. We just have to find better regulation for the online misinformation and so on. And I don't think that's going to work. Now you ask a specific question, which is what are we going to do? Um, I think it would be a mistake to center our politics around the question of whether or not this or that initiative will reach those who are, you know, in the fall of 2023, fully in the MAGA camp for right. ideological reasons, as well as because they do exist in a completely separate information environment. I think that would completely paralyze politics. It, it would just be setting, you know, anyone who tries that just sets themselves up for failure. At the core of the MAGA movement is the claim that only they are the real people, and it is their pr prerogative to decide what is good and what is not good in America. And I don't think we should replicate and perpetuate that idea by making them the final arbiters of a small d democratic politics. Ultimately, you have to accept, no, there, are, there is a substantial, it's not a majority, not at all a majority, but there's a substantial part of the population that is, again, for ideological reasons, for reasons of the information in, in, environment in which they exist, just not on board with pluralistic democracy. You're not going to reach them with any small d democratic politics. Oh, you're going to love a column I have coming up on Thursday. <laughs> you know, there is this... Um, Republican Ashcroft from the Ashcroft family, who is running for governor there. And he made the statement that if uh, abortion were re-legalized in his state, he'd have to resign because he couldn't possibly follow the law. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this guy was in office when Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. So put that to a side. But I think it speaks, and Johnson says this more explicitly than anyone has, that they don't take an oath. They don't believe in the constitutional enterprise. They believe in a theocratic vision that is not pluralistic, that is not democratic, that seeks to impose a particular brand of white nationalism, white Christian nationalism on the rest of us. And Whatever gets in the way, whether it's truth, whether it's an election, whether it's, um, you know, whatever, that has to take second place to the enforcement of this ideology. And I think Johnson, in a way, made this more explicit than anyone else when he says, the Bible is my rule book. Yeah. Yeah, guy, but you took an oath to the Constitution. So right. how is that going to work out? You got two rule, rule books? What happens to the Constitution? So I think the notion that, frankly, these guys are not fit to serve because they can't really uphold the oath of our Constitution is one Democrats have sort of been afraid to make. Um, it's almost like we have to accept these people with all these wild beliefs. No, if you can't take an oath, if you cannot accept the American project, which is not based on race, not based on religion, you really have no place in public office. And I don't think Democrats say that nearly enough or ever. Well, it, it, it is a, look, it's a scary proposition to accept, right? Um, I can sit here and say, you know, I'm not a politician. I don't have, you know, I don't need to convince people to vote for me. Um, I, I can say my allegiance is to getting the diagnosis right. And the diagnosis is um, that, you know, again, the what used to be called the conservative movement, um, the American right, the, the reactionary right, um, their allegiance is not to democracy. Their allegiance is not to constitutional government. Their allegiance is to, to a vision of America as a land of and for white Christians, in which white Christians, white Christian men specifically, have a right to be at the top and have a right to decide what is and what is not America and what is and what is not American. And they have a right to sort of shape the polity in their own image, right? Um, to have sort of their own image reflected back at them at all times. That is, that is what their allegiance is to. Now, for most of American history, they've been able to make their peace or find some sort of arrangement with the kind of democracy that America was, because it was a narrowly restricted form of democracy. It was a kind of democracy that was, again, by international comparison, pretty democratic if you happen to be a white Christian man, and something entirely different if you were not, 
right? Um, and so with that kind of restricted form of democracy, and it really doesn't matter what you want to label it. Is it a white man's democracy? Is it a, uh, is it a sort of a, a racial cased democracy? Doesn't matter. The label doesn't matter. What matters is it was a form of democracy that left this sort of, again, this sort of traditional hierarchies of race, gender, religion, and wealth largely intact and largely untouched. And with that form of democracy, most of the right, never all of the right, but most of the right kind of made its peace, right? They found an arrangement. Okay, that was the deal. Okay, we'll, we'll accept this as long as, as long as that kind of democracy doesn't undermine what we consider either the traditional order or the natural order, or depending on who you ask, if you ask Mike Johnson, he would say the divinely ordained order, right? But that doesn't work anymore because this country has become so much more, well, less white and, and, and more pluralistic. Um, and it has become less religious for mostly demographic reason, honestly. Um, and in this situation, again, I mean, they, they have made a very clear choice. If it comes to the point where even this sort of narrowly restricted, where you can't uphold the kind of narrowly restricted form of democracy anymore, well, then democracy has to go. It's not that sort of vision of America as a land of and for uh, white Christian and white Christian men specifically. It's not that vision that has to go. It's democracy that has to go. That is the choice. And I really don't, I really don't know how they could be any more, any clearer about this, right? right? I mean, I always tell people like, don't, don't listen to me. If you don't want to believe me, that's entirely fine. Um, but listen to what they are saying because they, they couldn't be, I guess, to their credit, they could not be more honest about this. Correct. And that's why in some ways Mike Johnson is such a gift because he says it so blatantly and, uh, without any embarrassment, without any, um, you know, concealment. But just to underscore your point, you know, PRRI and Brookings does yeah. this American value survey. And the last one they did, 75% of Republicans, not a bare majority, 75% of Republicans believe America was founded as a Christian country to, de to defend, quote, Western civilization, Western yeah. values, which is a code word, obviously, for um, white Christianity. That's a frightful number. That tells me that this is not about Donald Trump. This is not about, you know, a single election. This is about millions of people who have essentially bought out of uh, the American experiment. And that's why every election is kind of this perils of parli you know, Pauline. Are we going to be able to survive, you know, another one of these? Um, and I don't know whether we are afraid to recognize that or whether Trump has simply become a shorthand for this. But if you were going to explain to the American people what the stakes are in 2024, some people say democracy is on the ballot. I'm not sure people know what they mean by democracy. And those people have their own view of democracy, which is their vote counts. Um, so I don't find that message. Um, very helpful. What would be the idea or the warning that you would give to the American people in any election, frankly, about what the stakes are? Well, the stakes really are. Um, I think the the fundamental uh, um, problem, or the, the 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 that which that with which we all have to grapple right now, is that it, the the struggle over whether or not this country should become what it never has been, but always has sort of claimed to be, or always has sort of as an aspiration, which is that sort of the kind of democracy in which an individual status is not largely determined by race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, gender orientation, or wealth, a, you know, a, 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 a multiracial pluralistic democracy in, in that sense, um, which this country has never been. Um, but it's sort of always, there was always that aspiration, right? That is in this, all people are created equal. That is ultimately this sort of vision. That was always one idea of what this country should be. And the other one we have just discussed, the other one was no, this should be first and foremost a, a land of and for white Christians with sort of white Christian patriarchal uh, 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 dominance, and so the, the the it is not a new phenomenon that it is contested 
in, in, in America, what kind of democracy, how much democracy, for whom, who should be included, who should not be included in the democratic promise. That is not a new development. That has always been contested. There has all, there have always been these competing and, and sort of these competing visions of what this country should be. What is new, however, um, and is a very recent phenomenon is that the, the, uh, this conflict over basically that kind of multiracial pluralistic democracy, yes or no, it maps onto and it aligns with the fault lines in the in the struggle between the two major parties. That is an entirely new phenomenon, right? That was not the case, certainly not until uh, the 60s at all. Um, and then it took decades of what we call partisan sorting for the parties to become what they are today. Um, and so today, these fault lines, they completely align. Um, but that is a problem for any democracy because it means that in any election, in any election, democracy itself is on the ballot. And in a stable democratic system, that should not be the case. Right. Elections should be about, well, this policy or that policy, right? They should be about fiscal policy or uh, uh, taxes or whatever, right? And we like to pretend sometimes that that is still the case. I think a lot of people like to pretend that we ha are having arguments over uh, 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 policy issues. But, you know, those arguments are so infused with that underlying struggle over what kind of democracy and democracy at all, this should be going forward, um, that this is actually a struggle that we're having. Um, and that is a big problem because it also means um, if, if there is a fundamentally um, anti-democratic uh, party, major party on the ballot, that also means it only has to win once. Right. It could be the case that well, whereas the, the pro-democracy forces basically have to win every time, whereas the other side, um, it, it, there could be a situation in which they only have to win once. And I think, again, this is not, uh, you know, if you talk to democracy scholars, whether they are historians or sociologists or political scientists, it doesn't matter. There's a, a vast consensus that if Donald Trump were to return to the presidency in 2024 or, you know, 2025 win win the 2024 election that would be the end of uh democracy that doesn't mean democracy as it exists now or as it existed pre-2016 was perfect um or or even great um i think there is there's absolutely a need to not just go back to the pre-2016 situation but but find a sort of a transformative vision that that can take us to a place that that is not just the situation that led to Trump in the first place. Right. Um, but, but it still matters, right? It still matters if you have constitutional government in place or you don't. Um, and Trump, I mean, again, once again, he, they, he could not, he and the people around him could not be clearer about what they want to do if they get back to power. Um, and that, that should, I mean, that, that is the problem. It's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate that there is a, a this sort of a national commentariat um, of again this goes from center right to well into sort of center left at least that is somehow devoted to calling all this alarmism or calling it hy hysteria or, or any any such things when again that is the fundamental reality of the American political conflict right now because the conflict over democracy yes or no aligns with the conflict between the two major parties. Democracy is on the ballot in every re in every election. And again, Trump says it. He says he is going to use the Justice Department to yep. persecute and prosecute his enemies. He says he's going to declare some kind of national emergency and order out the troops. This is not something that Jen Rubin and Thomas Zimmer like come up with in, you know, our minds and say, Oh, I bet he's going to do this. I bet he's going to do that. He is telling us right now. He's telling us he's telling us he's going to destroy a professional civil service and fill it with his political acolytes. So we don't have to really guess. He's telling us. Um, and the reason I think why Democrats keep wondering, well, he keeps saying these outrageous things and he's even more popular with his base. How can that be? 
the answer is, of course, he's popular because that's what they want. Right. And that's what he is playing to. They don't want democracy. They want their guy who is a cultural, racial, um, gender um, embodiment of their ideal. They can't, you know, there's a constitutional amendment that keeps, you know, Orban from becoming president of the United States, but they've got something better. They've got Donald Trump. Um, I mean, they, you know, that's funny that you that you bring up Victor Orban because he might he might be the one person who might give Donald Trump a run if if he could if he could if he could run um, yes as, as, exactly. as an opponent exactly. because they love him so much exactly and you know it is frightful that once again he took power in a democratic election yeah. and he attacked the press he helped divide the opposition. He did all of these things, and then he gets reelected. So why would he ever leave? Um, and once they're in, either in practical terms, because there's no opposition that's allowed, um, or because of the way they insinuate themselves into the political structure, that's your guy then. That's, that's the regime, um, and you're not going to be able to get rid of it. Let me switch gears ever so slightly and talk about the role of capitalism and big business in all yeah. of this. When you look back in history, when fascists came to power, big business was always right there with them, cutting a deal, saying they were going to be taken care of, they were going to get certain benefits, they were going to keep communism, socialism, workers, whatever they were uh, afraid of out of their hair. How do you communicate in 2023 to business that they have a stake in democracy, that capitalism as they've known, as they've understand stood it, doesn't work if the guy can arrest you and your board of directors, if the guy can decide you're going to be the one that's audited, you're going to be the one that's regulated. How do you break this um, absolute, I think, willful blindness of business that says, it's okay, whoever wins, we can get along, we can make a deal. How, how do you um, go about unraveling that? So I really don't think business is going to come to the rescue of democracy. Um, no, I don't. But it, it we just like has, to lean in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it never has anywhere. And quite often, just like you said, it's done the opposite. It's sided with sort of, democracy's enemies. I think we need to be honest about the general dynamics here. The first one is business is, if nothing else, interested in profit. And if you make that your sole concern, then the plutocratic part of the Republican agenda is just fine for you. Right. Um, there is also the fact that a kind of libertarianism defined by market fundamentalism has always been one strand of the conservative alliance as it emerged yes. in what we call modern conservatism around sort of the middle decades of the 20th century. And more generally, the higher up you go the ladder of power in all spheres of American life, the more white and the more male, and obviously the wealthier it gets. So I, I don't think it's a radical assumption to make that a lot of the nation's most powerful business elites tend to be at least somewhat skeptical towards the idea of turning this country into a truly egalitarian, multiracial, pluralistic democracy, because that would inevitably level certain established hierarchies of race and gender and wealth from which these people benefit very much. However, um, that doesn't mean that business can't, under certain circumstances, mobilize for democratic purposes. I think an interesting case is the failure of Republican bathroom bills in 2015-16. Uh, so those were bills forcing people to use a bathroom according to their gender assigned at birth. Um, right. So they were targeting uh, uh, um, uh, um, trans people. Such a bill was passed, for instance, in North Carolina in 2016, and it led to a huge backlash, uh, yes. a backlash that was very much a business backlash. Uh, the NBA, for instance, the National Bas that Basketball Association, pulled out its, its All-Star game from Charlotte. There was a lot of pressure from businesses, really in stark contrast to what we are seeing or not seeing in response to the wave of anti-trans legislation over the past three years. So yes. what happened there in 2015-16? Right? Why did we have that sort of business mobilization against this sort of reactionary project at that point. Um, I think it's unlikely that business was so much more liberal in 2016 than it is today. But during the previous round of bathroom bills, businesses didn't want to be associated with that reactionary political project, mostly because many businesses rely on a consumer base that is 
younger, more affluent, more urban. I mean, that is, again, why sports companies often appear, quote unquote, woke, right? Like the yeah. NBA did or like Nike supporting Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. um, yes. That's purely from a business standpoint. They are incentivized to not go against these demographics that tend more liberal. And so there's also an understanding that due to demographic change, this is where America, American demographics are headed generally. And I think that is the hope. The business incentives align uh, with a pro-democratic -demo behavior at some points, but that requires work. You have to make that happen. It requires consumers, but sp specifically people with bigger platforms, political leaders, societal leaders, to make it clear that they expect businesses to act in such a pro-democracy fashion, to make it clear to them that otherwise there will be a price to pay. Make businesses understand, for instance, that if you continue to advertise on Tucker Carlson's show, mm -hmm. we see that. Right. We see yes. the companies that still advertise on Tucker Carlson's show. And then you can do that. But if you associate with such reactionary extremism, well, then that has consequences in a democratic society. And I think that is what happened in 2016. Um, because there was a lot of effort put into, again, specifically addressing all these businesses, these companies, the NBA, for instance. And I say that because I, I, you know, I'm a basketball fan. So I, this is, sort of, <laughs> this is in my mind. Um, there was a lot of effort put into, uh, telling the NBA, listen, we see this. We see you doing business with this state that has just passed this bill. And we are expecting you to do something here. And I've, again, I think, I think there is work to be done. And it, it, it has to start with political leaders, societal leaders to use their platform, um, to, you know, sort of put that out there that there is this, this expectation that we expect pro democratic behavior. Right. The other example I think of was that briefly Arizona was on the hot seat when they passed, um, very anti immigration. They were yeah. essentially going to take on themselves the role of the border and businesses did forego, um, having conventions and, uh, organizing events there for a brief period of time. So again, if I think it's easier for them, if you can find one state and yes. one specific thing, the problem now, for example, is if you were going to do that, for example, on abortion, you'd have to rule out them going to 25 states, which is a harder proposition um, than a single state doing something that they say, well, yeah. that's bad. That's that's a bridge too far. Yeah. Um, so I think the the fact that the right has been so successful on reproductive um, tyranny um makes it that probably not the easiest lift in that area, as opposed to finding a state that has done something in particular that they can point to. Yeah, yeah. So, one of the ailments um, of the Democratic Party, and maybe it's true of all um, lowercase d Democratic parties that are built on broad-based coalitions as yeah. opposed to a single ideological position, and the Democrats are diverse, um, is that the temptation to fight among yourselves yeah. is so great that you wind up um, at each other's throats. Yeah. Um, we're speaking at a time where um, pro-Palestinian and uh, pro-Israeli Democrats are literally killing each other um, at each other's throats. And some people threatening not to ever vote for Biden because he's yeah. taken a certain position on Israel. Um, is this inevitable that it breaks down into infighting? And how do you reverse it or at least keep it under control so that you don't lose um, the ability to have what we know now is essential, which is this broad anti-fascist, anti-authoritarian coalition that if it can stick together, can win elections. Right. So first of all, I think it's absolutely crucial to acknowledge this fundamental asymmetry between the two sides. 
because of decades of what we call partisan sorting, we are now in a situation in which the overwhelming majority of the Republican Party, of Republican voters, is white and self-identifying as conservative and Christian. And the Democratic Party, on the other hand, is vastly more diverse racially, ethnically, culturally, ideologically. And that gives them, that gives the GOP a massive, massive advantage. It is so much easier to mobilize a homogeneous base for instance, you can just fear monger about the left hating white Christians, right? And that works if, if most of the people you want to mobilize are, you know, identifying as, as white Christians. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, depends on votes from, you know, just as an example, both socially conservative black people and progressive white people. Um, I see, broadly speaking, three approaches um, of how to handle that problem that are influential within the Democratic Party. There is what is often called popularism. There is Bidenomics, um, and there is the sort of defend democracy plea to action. The first one, popularism, it holds, very broadly speaking, that Democrats should just look at what polls well, what is popular, and do that. That sounds good in a vacuum, but in practice, it usually amounts to throwing vulnerable groups under the bus. Yes. Um, it, it usually amounts to, oh, how about we don't do anything about the assault on trans people? How about oh, like abortion rights? Is that really so important, right? So not surprisingly, it is mostly white male pundits who love to present themselves as popularists. Yes, don't talk about social issues. We've heard exactly. that by time in memorial. Exactly. And they present that as, oh, that's just objective electoral, like, you know, being smart when it's really just their sensibilities um, put into politics or policies. Um, so, you know, that's not a good strategy, I don't think. Now, Joe Biden has been oscillating between the other two approaches. I think his instincts point him in the direction of what has been called Bidenomics. So, don't get bogged down in the quote-unquote culture war issues. Focus on socioeconomic issues instead on the pocketbook, right? If you think back to the State of the Union address in January, there was very little, comparatively little, on abortion rights or civil rights. It was all about the pocketbook. I'm not opposed to that as a matter of, of, of policy, but I do believe that pocketbook politics is a flawed approach in our current moment. As that is evidently not how many people define their interests right now. I mean, otherwise, how do you explain that white working class voters vote for Republicans? Are they all just delusional? Do they all just not see what their like real interests are? I, I, I don't want to, you know, my, I don't think we can we can build our politics on the diagnosis that these people are just too dumb or too delusional to, to see what their real interests are. Um, no, they, they understand. They, they understand that the political conflict is defined by two fundamentally incompatible visions, and they, they don't like the one that they believe the Democratic Party stands for, which is multiracial right. pluralism. So they're not going to vote for Biden because their overriding concern is to keep America what they believe it should be, a land in which, again, white Christians have a right to define what does and what does not count as America and America. Now that leaves the third approach, which is mobilize your diverse coalition around the idea of defending democracy and basic rights. And that was the focus before the 2022 midterms. Yes. If you think back to the, the big democracy speech that Biden gave in Philadelphia, I think he, he used the term soul of the nation. So it's often been called the soul of the nation speech in September. That was very effective. It mobilized, certainly in blue and purple states, an anti-MAGA coalition. Um, and that included even a lot of those people who didn't like person, uh, Biden personally and didn't think the economy was doing great. So usually we would expect them by, you know, the, 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 uh, the usual sort of political science wisdom is, well, those people will not vote for the president or the president's party, but they did. Because, yes. again, this kind of mobilization work. And I tend to think that in the current situation, the best approach is this, not just for electoral reasons, but because it aligns with what democracy scholars all say is the situation in, in this country that democracy itself has, be has become a partisan issue. But here's my sort of my, if, 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 I, if I ever had sort of an audience with anyone who has the president's ear, um, <laughs> here's what I would say. I do think there is a great deal of skepticism on the left and among younger voters specifically, who think that this call to defend democracy might ultimately just be a fig leaf behind which a coalition of restoration is determined to just restore the pre-Trump normal. And if that is the case, if the defend democracy coalition will 
I think it would not just lose those voters, right? If, if they came to the conclusion that w- what is going on here is just they're telling us to defend democracy and basic rights, but they really want to just go back to 2016. I think, I think then we would not just lose those voters. I think it would also fundamentally misjudge the situation. Merely returning to pre-2016, I don't think that's enough. I think the, the resistance to Trumpism under the banner of democracy and crisis will have to be tied to a transformative vision that could actually move us beyond the status quo ante so that we are not back in a situation that resulted in Trump in the first place, but closer to America becoming that which it has, it, it never has been yet. That sort of egalitarian, multiracial, pluralistic democracy. So I, I hope, I hope again that there is, uh, you know, I, I am very much for the sort of defend democracy approach, but I, I struggle sometimes when I think this is still a very broad coalition. It goes from sort of never Trump conservatives all the way like deep into the liberal, even left corner. And I think we need to have a an honest conversation about what is it we mean when we say democracy, defend Absolutely. democracy. What does that mean? What what is the vision for democracy here? Is it just restoring 2016 pre-Trump, or is there something more going on here? We need to have an honest conversation about this because the struggle is not just democracy versus authoritarianism. It is also within the small D democratic camp a struggle over how much democracy and for whom. And that struggle, we need to talk about that. We need to have an honest conversation about that. It's interesting. Biden kind of glanced by that issue coming out of COVID when he talked about um, we can't go back to the way it was. We have to build the economy bottom up, middle out. Um, And he used transformative language in some of that um, because I think at some level he understood that It wasn't so great before that that's such a clarion call to get everybody, you know, all excited about. Um, But politically, legislatively, that agenda kind of had to contract. Um, He, I think, um, was more concerned about appealing to center-right people who he thought uh, he didn't want to appear too liberal, didn't want to appear too progressive. And so he kind of backed off from it. And I think Democrats are perpetually terrified that they're going to be labeled socialists. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And so, yeah. so he didn't really embrace it. Um, but you raise an interesting prospect, which is Bidenomics has been um, very much about restoring the economy that was shattered in the COVID and in the um, recession. And he talks about returning 14 million jobs, returning, you know, manufacturing. Right. But we don't have a forward-looking vision of what the end result is. What does America look like if more people have more wealth? What a more what does America look like if unions are rebuilt? What does it what does it look to like people? Biden um has many strengths. Um Big picture um, is not necessarily one of them. He's not Obama. Obama was brilliant at being able to paint something that people who didn't agree with him on lots of issues could get behind. Um, is there a way to kind of meld these issues to explain what a less hierarchical economy, a less hierarchical um, politics can do for America? Is that part of what is missing here, which is a positive vision of, listen, we can have the America, as you say, that we always dreamed of and and never had? So I would probably defend Biden a little more here, um, which is interesting because I'm I'm not the biggest uh, Biden uh, fan in the world. Um, But he had, I mean, the IRA, for instance, is a transformative yes. piece of legislation, Absolutely. a truly yeah. transformative piece of legislation. Um, and unlike anything any other Western democracy has done, right? That is a properly, no, we're not going, we're not just going back. We're, we're, we're doing something new here, something, something else. I think the question, the challenge is going to be, is there something, um, something 
something comparable on the on the level of the political system will it be will it be possible to democratize the political system and look that has to start with the, has to start with the supreme court because Absolutely. as long as as long Absolutely. as that is in place in the way it is in place right now we can talk about all sorts of beautiful things we could do um they'll just declare it unconstitutional and then that's over and i think that is one of those um if, if you think back at um you know, 2020, early 2021, um, after, you know, Republicans just pushed through Amy Coney Barrett, um, like shortly before the election, um, that caused the kind of outrage, um, the kind of concern that for a, for a while led to a serious discussion, even in sort of the democratic, more establishment sort of democratic uh, power centers of, well, okay, we have to do something. We can't, this cannot stand. There was talk about should this Supreme Court be, uh, you know, sh- should should we extend it? Um, is judicial review something we need to look at? That sort of thing. And then it completely died down because yes. the Supreme Court, they were smart enough, they, sort of the, the conservative or reactionary majority on the Supreme Court, they were smart enough to lay low a little bit. The fir- that first Supreme Court term in the, in the six three court, they they didn't they, like they they. They didn't really intervene in, in the kind of way they did in 2022. And so we went right back to, oh, no, it's fine. It's going to be fine. John Roberts will be just, you know, moderate, whatever. And then they did 2022. And then we had this discussion again after Dobbs for a minute or two. Yes. And then again, it, it, it goes away and nothing happens. And so at some point, right, at some point, there will have to be some like truly transformative uh, 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 kind of intervention to the political system to democratize the political system, that will have to happen, I think. Otherwise, again, we will stay on this trajectory which, in which the best case, not even the worst case, I'm not even talking about Trump coming back to power in, in, in 2024, 2025. Um, again, in this case, we don't even have to have this conversation. But even the best case to me, like looking at the next 10, 20 years seems to be a, a, a system that is at the federal level, a, a somewhat democratic, small d democratic, but dysfunctional, right? Because the, the GOP is basically guaranteed enough power to sabotage any kind of transformative legislation. And then on the state level, completely falls apart into red states that are incre- increasingly and openly authoritarian and blue states that are trying to be sort of functioning multiracial pluralistic democracies. That is a mess and that cannot work, right? It cannot work. Whatever you want to call the whole of that, right? It doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what you want to label it, but I think we can all agree that cannot, that's not a functional democracy, clearly, and it cannot work. Um, that, that is a country falling apart. That yes. is red versus blue falling apart. And that will have to be, this situation will have to be resolved. It will have to be resolved one way or the other. It could be resolved in the direction of a more democratic uh, system, or it could be resolved in the direction of an ever more aggressively authoritarian system, right? That is, f- in which those who are in power are fully aware that they do not have majority support, which is why they are, they are increasingly leaning on sort of oppressive uh, uh, um, uh, policies, uh, oppressive strategies to, to stay in power. That is not great. That is, that is terrifying. Um, by the way, it's also terrifying for the rest of the world because America yes. is too big and too powerful for, for it to be so paralyzed and so dysfunctional, um, deep into the 21st century. And so again, at some point, something's going to have to give. It is, um, I tend to think, um, it's not necessarily 1930 that we're back to. It's 1860. It is the house divided. It is two incompatible views of what America is about. Um, and rather than have a civil war about it, um, I do think, um, and here's where Biden is probably not the best voice on this. Biden, um, is very goosey about Supreme Court reform. Right. He Yep. He convened a commission, uh, which did some great work. They didn't necessarily reach agreement and he kind of gave it the back of the hand, which was completely unhelpful. Um, so he may not be the right one to do this, but I think the notion that this is about, um, the freedom of choice, the freedom of, um, 
everyone to reach their potential, liberty, freedom, which actually Vice President Harris has used again and again, which I think is um, very effective. This is about um, not being told how to live your life by a single small group of people, whether it's the Supreme Court small group of people or whether it's the legislature of Mississippi or whoever it may be. Um, so I do think this um, sense of kind of liberation from right. um, tyranny, liberation from the dead hand of the Supreme Court that, you know, these people now live, you know, forever so that a Supreme Court that went into effect, you know, in the 1990s, which now I guess is a long time ago, um, and wants to freeze the Constitution in 1858 yeah. um, is now running the country. So I think somewhere in there is a message of we don't want to be guided by the dead hand of history, or yeah. the dead hand of the Supreme Court. We want to be a modern, self-actualizing, self-fulfilled democracy. And you know what? I think there is in, in everything we've been discussing, there is a a more optimistic, a, a glass half full kind of reading of recent US history and of our current moment. Because the reactionary counter mobilization from the right is not coming from a place of strength. Yes. The right is radicalizing because they understand that they are in the minority and they feel their backs against the wall, which is leading to this kind of siege mentality that that we see. They are radicalizing out of a sense of weakness. They are, and they are reacting. They are reacting to something real, due to political and social and cultural and most importantly, probably demographic developments. The country has indeed moved closer than ever before to becoming that sort of multiracial, pluralistic, egalitarian democracy. And I think America has a real chance here to demonstrate that such a democracy, one in which again the individual status is not significantly determined by race religion, gender, sexual orientation, or wealth, is actually feasible under conditions of multiracial, multireligious pluralism. And that is a chance of world historic significance, because such a democracy has basically never existed anywhere in the world. We've had a lot of stable, uh, pretty liberal democracies under very homogeneous conditions, like think Scandinavia. You right. don't look at the Swedish society and you see a lot of multiracial, multi-religious pluralism, right? right. Okay, so we've, we've, we, I think we've, it's been established under that condition, under those conditions, in a very small society, that can work. But under conditions of proper multiracial, multi-religious pluralism, can we do it, right? And that is, again, it's, it's, it's a big challenge, but it's a, it's a world historic chance also to demonstrate to the world, no, that can actually work. But we need to acknowledge that as of right now, it is, I think, at best an open question whether or not this this vision of true democracy can overcome the radicalizing forces of reaction. So big challenge, but again, um, there is there's a big chance here. Well, I think that's about as optimistic as we're ever going to get you and I <laughs> on this uh, subject. So maybe we'll have you back on another program and we can just talk about the glass half full. We'll just... <laughs> find all of the green shoots. We'll find all of the positive signs um, and we'll reassure our, one another. Either that or um, you'll have the bottom bump, bunk. I'll have the top bunk at re-education camp um, <laughs> in uh, Camp uh, Trump. Um, Listen, I have, a, I have a German passport. I can, I, I'm German. Hey, I can just, I can just always. I know. I you guys leave. always have one foot out the door. <laughs> I know. I know. Thomas, it has been an absolute delight. Um, tell people where they can find your work and um, where uh, they can kind of keep up with the daily beat of Thomas Zimmerman's. Well, um, the home base for all my public work is my Substack newsletter. It's called Democracy Americana. Um, I also host my own podcast together with Liliana, Liliana Mason. Um, it's called Is This Democracy? So we're basically discussing all of these questions all the time. And I'm also active on social media under my name, at Thomas Zimmer. That's on Blue Sky. And everywhere else I am, at tzimmer underscore history. Um, still active way more than I should be on all of those social media channels. I often wonder how you have time in your day because you are very active. <laughs> um, thank you again. Uh, I commend all the things that you write and talk about to our audience. Um, thank you, and we will have you back soon. Thank you so much. And that was Thomas Zimmer. What a fascinating guy he is and how insightful. I think the things that I take away from that 
discussion were, first of all, we have to be much more candid with the American people about what is at stake. It is not simply Donald Trump and Donald Trump's authoritarian nightmare, although that is plenty to worry about. It is really, as he said, about these two conflicting visions of America. Do we want a vision of America where you and I get to decide how we want to live our lives, get to participate um, in a pluralistic, multiracial, multi-religious democracy? Or are we something else? Are we a authoritarian society in which as Orwell said, some are more equal than others. Um, and the white Christian doctrine is the law of the land. And it's not like this is hypothetical. We've already seen it from the Supreme Court. We've had it articulated by people like Mike Johnson, who are telling us that the Bible, their view of the Bible, is his, quote, rule book. And I think we can't sugarcoat this, and there will be plenty in the media who, as Thomas pointed out, say, oh, you're being hysterical, it's not really about that, Donald Trump isn't that bad, or they just say a lot of these things to impress their followers. No, we need to take this seriously. And it's almost as if we didn't have January 6th. That was the proof. These people would prefer an authoritarian leader over democracy because what they get out of it is this anti-democratic, anti-pluralistic vision of America. So I think we all have a lot of work to do. And I would urge all of you, as I do in my writing and on social media, to get with the program. Joe Biden is the nominee. He is going to be the nominee. All of this crying about we need somebody else or he needs to dump Kamala Harris, it's not happening, folks. Get off of it. And instead, we need to really think about how to pull together the various strands of the pro-democracy coalition. And as Thomas says, paint a hopeful, optimistic image of America, of a democracy that we have always aspired to and never quite attained, but that we have a historic opportunity to do just that. If you like this program, please tell your friends, tell them to listen and follow us. They can find the program on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever they get their podcasts. Bye-bye. <laughs>